the slide here, but we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Drew Gordon. I am the director of agency and community outreach at Pantheon. If you're not already familiar with Pantheon, we are the best Drupal optimized hosting on the planet, and we combine that with uh, some really great tools to make teams more effective and efficient. Uh, if you want to hear more about that, you can come down. We've got a demo booth, T-shirts, um, and you can get a hold of me these ways. So uh, D Gordon on the Twitter, uh, that's my email, and. Hey, I'm Rob Bayless. I'm the CTO at Last Call Media. Uh, if you haven't heard of Last Call Media, we're a small uh, Drupal agency in Western Massachusetts. Uh, personally, I spend a lot of time working with organizations on their process uh, and their development workflow. Cool, and for those of you just coming in, it's okay. It's a friendly crowd. There are seats, a couple of them in the front, so make your way in, no worries. Um, so we're talking about continuous integration and just sort of like level set. Uh, continuous integration is not something that was invented with the web. Continuous integration is a computer's sort of like uh, best practice has evolved over many years. We recently, relatively recently, as a community of, of uh, practitioners, have picked up continuous integration and said, we should do this for websites. Uh, and so in the context of websites, as Josh Koenig says, uh, it's really the process of taking your live content and configuration and combining it with the latest dev code, the code that's in process, and putting together those quickly and fearlessly and being able to see the results and know what's gonna happen if you actually get that stuff live. So that's really all, you know, like we have lots and lots of jargon words. When we say continuous integration, that's really what it's all about. Uh, and continuous integration assumes a couple of things. Uh, one of those is that there's some time compiling or building. Um, again, this has been common in computer science for a long time. Uh, and those things take a lot of time. And as XKCD reminds us, uh, it's, a, it's a delay between you going ahead and hitting something and then the computer's coming back with results. And I, you know, they, they capture it quite well. There's some downtime there. Uh, time in which you're able to legitimately claim you're working while sword fighting because the computers are doing the work for you. You might choose to spend your time talking to your project manager or catching about Slack or other things, but also legit. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about how we got here because this is not the end of the evolution of continuous integration and all the tools and the, the, the things that we're inventing to make our jobs easier. So just looking back a ways, once upon a time, web pages were very simple things. and Websites were made of very simple things. It's HTML, CSS, some JavaScript, and some assets. And that's where we started in the 90s. We're building sites that are just these things. This was all of the layers. Um, and those sites might look like this. And for those, did anybody see Todd Dinkirk's presentation earlier? Like apparently this is, he also featured this site. This site still exists. It's called Space Jam. For those who remember the, the web of the 90s, it was a glorious time of doing really interesting things with images and whatnot. And um, anyways, this is an old website. Still works, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, some assets, etc. cetera. Uh, however, when you are managing a site that has a, a lot of those things, you start running into problems, right? And so uh, Rasmus Lerdorf invented PHP to account for some of those things. Uh, it was basically a, uh, a tool for helping process forms as well as to do some templating, right? And this PHP then got involved to help build all of these other things. And then that sort of kicked off the, the development of content management systems as a thing. So PHP, the content management system is simply something, it's PHP talking to a database, it's got some source CSS, it's got some source JavaScript, some source assets, it might resize those, it might optimize the JavaScript, et cetera. And the content management system is then doing a build for us. It's a, a layer of abstraction that is managing all this stuff for us, and it's kind of doing it on demand, right? There might be a caching layer there, but this is the start of the, the, the journey that we're talking about today, really. It goes all the way back to the idea of PHP as a thing. Um, because we add more tools to make our lives easier. So Josh Make, SAS, CoffeeScript, other things like that uh, get added to our tool belt, and we start adding yet another layer. So you have a Git repo where you have your Josh Make custom code, your SAS is happening, CoffeeScript is there, other things as well perhaps. But it starts to cause some confusion, and you know, for those of us who maybe live through this, uh, sort of philosophically you run into some questions you need to answer, like, who owns the CSS, right? So if you're compiling, so you're working with SAS because it's helpful, it's better than raw CSS for many reasons. Um, what happens, are you, are you storing the artifact 
that is the compiled CSS, and what if I use a different build tool than Rob, or somebody else on the team's got something slightly different? You start getting into like weird spots, and like how do we handle this as a team? What, is our, what are our rules and whatnot? Um, and I think philosophically, we arrive at the spot like what we're trying to do with version control is capture the knowledge that is required to build the system. That's, the, that's like the crucial thing that we're, what we're trying to do. And then you let the robots take it from there, and the systems take it from there, and use that knowledge, and go ahead and create the system after that. Um, so that, is, for example, is what Composer does. So we add tools like Composer, and Bower, and NPM uh, to manage these dependencies. So you can simply declare, I want Drupal 8. I want this module. I want this version of this. Um, and then system takes it from there. Um, again, extends the chain just a little further. So now we've got local development talking to a Git repo. There's a build tool somewhere. The order might be reversed, for example, in, in your particular setting, but that then creates a CMS, and eventually that builds a web page. Uh, and it can get a little overwhelming, though. Like, we've already had a lot of things that we've had to learn to get to this point in web development, and we just, blah, a lot more. Um, and so we're going to be showing a lot of code, and we've got a, a, a Git repo that has a lot of uh, sample stuff, and you'll be able to check that out. Uh, for those of you who are just sort of early into continuous integrations, sort of may, maybe taking baby steps, or maybe you've got a process that you're hoping to improve, it's, it's okay. Um, because as uh, uh, Marie Curie reminds us, like, nothing in life is to be feared. It's only to be understood. So again, we'll be showing some things here. Um, in order to understand them, sometimes it's helpful to just take a step back. Like, why are we doing all this again? Like, that Space Jam site looks pretty good. Um, <laughs> could we just get back to the basics? Um, and what continuous integration really allows us, uh, there, there are at least two ways to sort of think about this, I think. Um, for your clients, for somebody who owns a website, uh, continue, a good, reliable continuous integration practice makes frequent updates possible and, and much lower risk. And that means work can get done faster and your budget can go further. Uh, as someone who builds websites for others, a good process gives you uh, something that you can share across multiple projects, uh, a chance to fix problems permanently. So for example, as, a, as an agency, you decide, look, we just want to make sure that we're something as simple as code styling, always following code style. We're going to build a process that always checks for that. It's a nice, easy sort of baby step into this, this whole thing. Um, because of what you're doing, because what you're doing is reflected in your clients sort of like confidence and rapid moving and agility of, of feature development and other things like that, the word of mouth goes up, their trust goes up. That's really valuable for anyone who builds websites as, as for a living because ultimately uh, we get future projects because our clients recommend us to others and they trust <laughs> us with their future work. Uh, and so a good CI system is, is really foundational and a, a real long-term competitive advantage. And it also, in some ways, allows us all to take on riskier projects. Because if you know you have a good safety net uh, that's, that's going to be there, sometimes you, know, you get a project like, this, I'm inheriting a site that sort of has some code smell to it, or there's something that's not quite in our comfort area. I would like us to go this direction. Uh, having a, a set of tools that helps you test your work, know, deploy with confidence, uh, can allow you to sort of take on a project like that and, and be more confident and just open up that sort of new line of business or meet that you know, new client and, and have the confidence to, to be able to do that. Um, because, again, in, in a complex e ecosystem, it's not about being the strongest or the smartest or the most talented dev, but what you need in order to survive and grow and thrive in the real world is, is uh, to be responsive to change, to embrace it, get better and improve. Uh, so this is what, so we're going to be showing a bunch of code here. This is sort of like the scaffold that we are, we're painting on top of. So this is, happens to be the normal Pantheon workflow. You have a dev test live, sort of process built in, and then the chance to do different kind of branches that feed into that. And on top of this, you can do some really cool stuff. Yeah, so uh, I just want to talk about kind of the workflow that we use at Last Call and how that's a slightly different from the normal Pantheon workflow. Uh, and as Drew mentioned, one of the really nice features of Pantheon is having this multi-dev available to, to us. Uh, how many of us have used Pantheon multi-dev? 
How many of us love it? Who haven't used it? Cool. Uh, yeah, we do too. It's really nice to be able to create uh, sort of an instance of a site that's totally away from the production pipeline. You don't have to have any crossover uh, or commit anything to your master branch that you don't want to make it to production. So it's a really powerful idea. But um, when you combine it with CI tools, really you need to be able to uh, integrate with an external repository. So for us, what that means, uh, this is our sort of feature workflow. If we have a new feature we're building or even a bug fix, uh, it's gonna go into a feature branch. It's gonna start with a developer, kind of making the change and then pushing it up to GitHub. Uh, we have a tool called CircleCI, which does our continuous integration for us. Uh, and ultimately, we're gonna be sending uh, what's called an artifact off to Pantheon. And that's gonna go up to a multi-dev instance where our stakeholders can review it. Uh, and again, one of the really sort of powerful tools here is being able to take that database and files from live back to the multi-dev in order to display the most recent stuff for review and also back to Circle CI during the build. When we push to production, it's gonna look pretty similar. Um, we're just gonna end up going to the master branch on Pantheon rather than to a feature branch. So really, what you end up with here is two repositories, and this is sort of a key idea to this whole uh, CI concept in Drupal. Uh, your source repository, or what we use for as GitHub is gonna only contain the custom stuff. So that would be like the site specific modules, themes, whatever, and then the knowledge of how to get all the other stuff. So Drupal core isn't even included in our source repositories. But we have a composer.json that specifies the version of uh, Drupal core that we need and CircleCI is able to pull that in for us. What gets sent up to Pantheon, on the other hand, is the full site. So all of the, all of the code you're gonna need to run it. So your compiled assets, your core, your contrib stuff, uh, plus any PHP libraries. And so this really answers the question of who owns the CSS, right? It's CircleCI, that our build tool is in charge of creating this for us. So I just wanna take a look at uh, sort of a fictional example. This is one of our real clients, uh, Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo, New York. Uh, and they have a beautiful looking Drupal 8 site that we took on not too long ago. Um, we didn't actually do the build on this site and so it's sort of unique in that we're taking on a project that we are not super familiar with. And of course, one way to mitigate the risk of taking on a new project like that is to add testing around it. So let's imagine that this client has a change that they'd like to make. They wanna add a border below their exhibitions block on their homepage. Pretty simple change, really. This is what they want it to look like. Uh, kinda tough to see that border, but uh, it's there. <laughs> uh, Definite improvement. Yeah, and uh, you know, good design is subtle, so whatever. Um, <laughs> I'm a developer, by the way, not a designer. <laughs> so. So anyway, first step is gonna be creating a GitHub issue for it. And issues kind of outline you know, what, what the task is. I'm sure we're all familiar, familiar with them. Uh, so we pasted in a picture of what we want it to look like and sort of a spec on what needs to change. As a developer, we're gonna go into the code base. We're gonna make a new CSS rule. We're gonna add a border to the bottom of that block title. When we save the file, we're gonna have our SAS recompile for us. And then locally, the next step, of course, is looking at the change. So if we re reload the browser, we can see that there's that border there. And uh, everything looks great, so let's ship it. So, because we're using feature branches, we're not gonna commit to master. We check out a new feature branch that's labeled after the issue and then we're gonna add our changes and kind of push them up. Uh, this lets us maintain that isolation and over on the GitHub side, what we're gonna end up with is a pull request. And I suspect most of us have worked with pull requests at one point or another, but uh, we really love them as a way to kind of isolate code and also to allow non-technical stakeholders to 
execute merges even if they need to. Um, so in this case, we're just creating that pull request. We're gonna leave a little description and creating this pull request is going to run our continuous integration suite for us. So we create it and in this case, because this is a magical demo, it instantly failed. Wouldn't do this in real life, but it would fail eventually. Uh, and that would, so, be the, that would be the sword fighting step right there. Yes, we right. We missed a whole lot of sword fighting. But um, then when we take a look at this build, we can see what failed. And so as the developer, we're like, oh no, there's a design deviation. Circle says there's a design deviation. What does that mean? So we can go to this artifacts tab. We can open up the report for a tool called Backstop.js. This is a visual regression testing tool that uh, basically snapshots the site. So on the left, what you're seeing is the reference or what it's supposed to look like. In the middle, you're seeing what it actually looks like. And then on the right is the overlay. And if we open this up and slide this slider, we can see sort of the difference in real time. So we can see that we have borders that we didn't plan on having. So as a developer, I now have the, all the tools that I need to fix this. I know that my CSS selector was way too broad and uh, it's pretty easy to fix. So really what we just watched was uh, you know, five, 10 minute turnaround time on something that may have taken a day to sort of for a QA person to come back and, and look at this ticket uh, if we send it up to a development environment somewhere and then they would have to write what happened, what I expected to see, what I actually saw. And so we're turning that around in five minutes. So when we talk about agility and being able to adapt, that's really powerful, having that fast feedback loop. Uh, so really all we're doing here is pushing the work to the machines. You know, we're, we're taking that super boring stuff away from the developer and away from the QA person and just saying, okay, we know that this footer block, which is what we were seeing there, is prone to breakage on this site. So let's snapshot it, let's add a test, and then it'll always work the way we expect it to. Um, before I really dive in on the build, uh, I am gonna get somewhat technical, but I wanna talk about a tool that we use internally. Uh, we use Gulp, and this is a tool that a lot of agencies use. The way we use it is maybe slightly different. We have um, a set of top level tasks. So we have so uh, install, check, build, test, uh, and then watch that are the same across all of our projects. And then down below those, we have individual tasks. So install is actually composer install and bower install. Uh, check is actually, you know, those four things. And so what this means is that when we switch back and forth between projects, we can have the same top level gulp commands for everything that we do. Uh, and then, our CI process also has the, those same top level commands. So this is a really nice tool to enable that kind of like fast context switching between projects and also to, to keep our CI builds more or less consistent between all the projects. Uh, it also wraps up a whole lot of complexity. So as a developer, I'm not really gonna need to know what the PHP unit configuration is. I'm just gonna need to know where to put my test and how to run it, just, just gulp test. So it's a nice system and we're gonna see it a lot in uh, the circle configuration. Uh, so I should just point out here that if you're having trouble reading this or uh, just wanna come back to it later, this is all available in a public repository which we're gonna link to multiple times. Uh, all of this stuff is open source and it's sort of the platform that we use to get started with uh, and you can too if you'd like. Uh, so we're looking at the circle.yaml file and if you've used a system like Jenkins or uh, Travis CI, you're probably familiar with this kind of concept. You're configuring the build in a file. And uh, what we're really seeing here is the dependencies section. So this is where we start pulling in all of our dependencies. So you can see we run the two that we really care about here are yarn install and gulp install. Uh, yarn install is actually gonna pull down gulp and all of those dependencies. And then um, 
Gulp install does everything else. Really simple process. Uh, the next step in the build is going to be setting up a Drupal site. And to do that, we all know we need a database. So uh, we set up the settings lab PHP, and then we reach out to Pantheon and grab a snapshot of the live database. If you had uh, sanitizing requirements or something like that, you could grab them from somewhere else too. It's pretty easy. And then uh, we have a Drupal console command, and thanks Jesus for all your work. Uh, this is a chain command that basically runs, yeah, let's give him a hand. Yeah, um, yeah this is a chain command, uh, and this is nice because it allows us to, in a YAML file, specify all of the Drupal console commands that we want to run after the database is imported. So that's things like configuration import, up, update the database, um, that kind of thing. So it's really nice as far as being able to share code between projects. Then we're going to proceed into tests, and uh, really what that means is run the build steps, uh, and then run our static code checks, and then run our full-on tests. And we're going to see all this in action in a moment. Uh, and then finally, assuming everything goes well during those other phases, we're going to deploy. And we have two different workflows, uh, and again, those really just correspond with whether we're going to multi-dev or to master. Uh, or to production. So the only difference here is that in this bottom one, the multi-dev step, we actually create a, a Pantheon multi-dev environment on the fly. So that's kind of powerful. Uh, as a developer, I can just create a new feature branch, send it up to uh, GitHub, and assuming all my tests pass, I have a fresh environment for it instantly. And just like a, a word on this, like so this is a fair amount of code and it looks maybe in a format you're not familiar with or some of the like, wow, that was a lot to parse. Uh, kind of the point of this a little bit is you write this once. You know, you can use it across multiple projects and it, it's, the, you're giving the machine the tools to build the thing. And you might have to look up the, uh, the syntax to, to write these things, but you know, start with the repo or add your own things. You, you really only have to figure it out once and then you can offload that from your brain into the scripts. Exactly. Yeah, as a developer, you don't need to worry about the nitty-gritty of how this is working 99% of the time. So, uh, okay, so we're going to actually watch a little video here. It's video time. I love video time. And uh, what we're seeing is a successful build. So I went in, you know, uh, and I fixed the specificity of the selector, so this test should pass now. And this might... I don't know, we'll see if this gets boring or not, but we're just gonna watch this happen in real time. Um, so first thing, there's a couple of housekeeping items that CircleCI needs to do, just kinda like start up containers for, for the CI job to run in, and then to actually run the Git checkout. So it's gonna clone down the stuff from GitHub. And I should note that this happens through a webhook, so this happens almost simultaneously as you push to GitHub. Uh, next thing, we're going to set up Docker, and we use Docker for the backstop test. Uh, again, I have to give a shout out to um, FFW, who I believe is maintaining, maintaining the Doxel project. Uh, we use their container there. Um, next, we're going to be setting up the versions, and really, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, one nice thing is that in alignment with Pantheon, we can, we can actually push a PHP version change through both the CI system and uh, Pantheon. So we can set, like, if we wanted to go from 5.6 to 7, we can change our PHP version in both Circle YAML and Pantheon YAML and push that up and have it test and deploy. Uh, so now we've proceeded on to the dependencies installation. Our entire Yarn install process took about three seconds, pretty quick. Uh, and now we're watching Composer happen, which is like watching concrete dry. Um, we are we're sort of <laughs> backed by the cache here, so uh, CircleCI has a, a nice feature where it'll load things from the cache uh, if, if they're there. So it's not quite that bad. So now how often do you in real life actually watch this? Never, process? never. never. Like yeah, this, uh, this is requests, something, exactly. You, you really don't need to worry about all this stuff. All you need to worry about is whether it turns red or green on, uh, on the pull request. 
So this is normally time I'd be sword fighting. Or making coffee. Or whatever, yeah. yeah. Work. 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 <laughs> so uh, at this point, you can also see we're, we're installing some development dependencies like PHP unit. Uh, and those will be stripped out before we get to the final deployment. But this is just kind of the initial setup. <clears throat> now we're into the database stuff. And we're grabbing that back up, which is pretty quick. Yep, nine seconds. Uh, this is not quick, however, so we're going to transition to the next video. Uh, and so this video just picks up where the, the other one left off about five minutes later when that database is finished importing. This particular site has a really big database for whatever reason. Uh, so now, again, we're running that uh, chain command, and on this site, it's going to set up a uh, stage file proxy for us, so we don't need to grab the files as well. It's going to turn off cron. It's going to do a couple other things. Uh, but really, you could do anything that you would do in a Drush or Drupal console command in there. And then we're proceeding into build. Build is pretty quick, and you can see the subtasks running there. And again, we're just executing build. Whatever that means for this site, it's happening. Now we start a, uh, a web server to run our tests off of. Cache rebuild, that's fun. Um, and then we're gonna proceed into the static code checks, which are fairly quick. Uh, for static code checks, we're gonna have the, the composer validation the uh, ESLint, which is JavaScript, and you can see we're going to have a couple of errors, and then uh, PHP CS, which is a really rigorous tool that I kind of hate, but keeps us honest. Uh, now we're onto the test phase. Uh, one nice thing about Gulp is that it's going to run tests, or it's going to run all of its tasks in parallel. So we start up BHAT, Backstop JS, and a front end performance testing tool called PhantomOS all at once, and those execute simultaneously. So even though those are three really slow tasks, they kind of run parallel. This is the Phantomos output, and it gives you a lot of data about how your, your front end is performing. Uh, and now we're watching Backstop run. Uh, and one thing that's cool about Backstop is it's going to snapshot your site. This is the visual regression testing tool. It's going to snapshot your site at the breakpoints that you give it. So we've said, give us phone, tablet, and desktop breakpoints. Uh, and then we've given it a couple of different pages to capture elements off of. Uh, and again, this stuff, you know, once this is set up and configured, you really never need to see this again. And one thing we'll talk about in a little while, like for those of you like maybe pulling in, like uh, does anybody here have, feel like they have a CI process that looks almost the same as this? Sweet. All right, and are there many, like, aspirationally, I think this is pretty cool, but yikes, how do you get there? Yeah, very brave <laughs> soul. I think there's more than one. I, so, Rob, did you start with this whole process? Absolutely not. No, no. right. So, <laughs> your first foray into this is set up a circle account and maybe do some, like, code checking, some static yeah. code analysis or something like that. And then on the next project, uh, this project, the footer breaks yeah. all the time because the, the, the CSS selectors are just archaic and our team didn't do it, which we don't know, so we're always breaking it. So we're going to add that one thing that we heard about at that one presentation at DrupalCon. Okay, cool. And now the next project, we're going to add another thing and another thing. Yep. And eventually you get to a pretty full feature thing and it's not done yet. Right. right? There'll right. be more that happens over time. Yeah. But you don't have to jump all the way to this. This is just showing you, you know, a particular combination of these things and what's possible. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, this is our solution, and maybe what makes sense for your organization is a whole different set of, of tools. Uh, but we just want to give you a taste of why this is valuable and what it would be used for. So uh, what we've been seeing going on in the background here is essentially all the tests passed, everything looks good, and so we sent it up. Uh, we reinstalled the composer dependencies and sent it to Pantheon. Uh, and really, all that is is just a uh, clone of the Pantheon repository, copy the code over, and then commit it and push it up to Pantheon. So again, two totally separate repositories only kept in sync by Circle here. <coughs> All right. And 
I don't think we need to watch the whole master deployment video. It's basically just the same thing. Uh, so now, uh, now that that's been sent up to Pantheon to that multi-dev instance, we have a new URL here. Uh, it's going to be P23 after the branch name. And we can see that our border is in place. Great, awesome. Let's send it off to the stakeholders for review. Everything looks fantastic. And so just to kind of recap what we did here, uh, we're at this phase. Uh, and we've gotten stakeholder sign off. I'm going to assume somewhere along the line we probably got code review on that pull request, because uh, we always do that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> next is uh, going to come this production flow. Uh, and again, we're not going to step through this stuff super detailed, but really it's, it's just a mirror of what we did there, except we push to the master branch and then it's a, a click button deployment to go from dev to test to live. So um, as a developer, this is a really nice workflow because my involvement in it is so minimal and I really have clear indications of when I'm needed on, on the task. Uh, if, a task. If a build fails, I'm needed. If something is ready to be merged, I'm needed. But otherwise, I can go hands off and it becomes someone else's problem. So let's kind of take a step back, uh, look at the lessons we've learned here and uh, how we would recommend implementing this uh, for other people. Uh, I think it's important to know, as Drew was saying, that this is, this is an ever-evolving ever thing. It's never finished. Uh, it's never going to be finished. It's basically, you're making an investment in your pipeline. Your pipeline becomes a product that you, as an organization, whether you maintain one site or 100 sites, uh, invest in. So over time, you're going to want to add things. You're going to want to change things. And that's OK. Uh, you know, you're not striving for perfection the first time. Don't let, I screwed this saying up earlier, don't let great, good, perfect. Uh, yeah, whatever. Don't let the one be the enemy of the other. Perfect. <laughs> the enemy of the other. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so next thing, start small. You know, as, as Drew was saying also, you've got to start with whatever makes sense for you. Um, for us, it was BHAT testing several years ago. We wanted to document those specs and really get a test suite sort of written up around the specifications that were happening, that were coming out of our, our discovery process. So we got that in place. And then we had uh, you know, a client that wanted, they had a strict front end performance budget. So we looked into tools that would do that. And we ended up with a tool called Phantomos. Uh, and we got that wired in. And then it was, um, what was next? Uh, static code checking. And then it was uh, backstop. So just one piece at a time. Um, and you really want to make sure you're focusing on the business value because at the end of the day, we do like cool tools as developers, but also you need to make sure that you're improving the value that you're providing to your clients or your, your stakeholders, whoever you work with. Um, yeah. And then uh, kind of the last thing I'd say is if you're an agency especially, um, Make sure that what you're doing is reusable. You don't want to be creating something for one project that you can't take across your entire infrastructure. Uh, it's really important to have consistency between projects. And starting with something like a scaffold allows you to do that, uh, allows you to bring that, that consistency across everything. Uh, so to that end, we have two different kind of offerings here. Uh, we have the scaffold that we've kind of been showing off. That's all the circle configuration, the gulp tasks, uh, as well as a composer managed build. And then we have sort of the uh, less opinionated version of that that you can adapt to whatever you'd like, which is Pantheon's uh, Drops 8 repository. Yeah. That's about it. That's what we want to share. So as expected, as we were hoping, we have plenty of time for questions. So uh, if anybody has questions, please, we ask that you come up here to the mic so that uh, people who, can, uh, who review the recording can uh, hear the questions as well. But anybody has questions, please step on up.
this shirt. He, for the for the audience, yeah, he's wearing the Doxel shirt. Yeah. You are using my image, so that's great. Nice. Awesome. It's great that it works for you. Uh, the question I had about backstop, uh, where do you store the reference images and how does it work? Do you keep it in Git? Do you keep it somewhere yeah. else? How do you, like, where do you pull it from? Sure. I, I, before, could everybody hear that question? Uh, I was going to say, I don't think that mic is on. It's on. Hey. <laughs> okay. All right. So, too tall. All right. So, do you I mind asking right. that again? So my question is, with backstop reference images, where do you store them? Do you keep them in the repo or somewhere else? Uh, how do you pull them yeah. to run the test? That's a really good question. And so what's worked for us so far is keeping them in the repository, uh, actually committing them, and that way they get version controlled. And during the PR review, we can see uh, if there was a visual change required, we can see exactly what the before and after was. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I also have a question about the uh, visual regression testing. That's when you make a change like the one that you showed, mm -hmm. you expect some visual changes. So mm -hmm. how do you go about making sure that it doesn't cause an error and stop everything and then require a special exception later on down the line? Yeah, so when I made that change, I was not expecting the change to the footer, which is what we were seeing. Um, Right, but how do you tell, uh, tell it that I do want to change in this place? Yeah, so this gets uh, back to the question of the reference screenshots. Uh, and so the reference screenshots are the ones that are committed to the repository that contain, that it was the screenshots on the left there, so what it should look like. So as a developer, I can run those backstop tests locally using the, the gulp task. And I can run it with the rebase flag, which will regenerate those reference screenshots for me. So, and that's what I'm saying. Um, as a developer who is reviewing, uh, when I take a look at that pull request, what I'm actually going to see is the new screenshots that were captured. I think so, buddy. What he's saying is there was some visual yeah. difference that was intended. It was, in fact, a design change. Yep. So capturing, so yep. that's going to throw at least the first time through a false negative. How do you handle that, right? Because you, there was a change to, like, adding the border was a design yep. deviation. Yep. So how do you account for that in process? So if we had had, and in this case I'm sort of cheating because we didn't have a test for the actual current and upcoming exhibitions block, right. which is what we were expecting to see changed. If we had had a test for that, we would have needed to regenerate the reference uh, screenshot before we push to avoid that false positive. Okay. Yeah. So are you expecting a fail first time around, or is that? Nope. No. Okay. No. Yeah, there, there's no intended fail there. It was just, yeah. Thank you. Other people might have to shorten it. So I like a lot of what I see as a manager and as a process fanatic. That's all great. One of the pushbacks that I get when we talk about this in our workflow is, first of all, we internally host our sites. And your example is the perfect pushback that I've gotten. I'm just changing a border. It's a specific selector. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of overhead. When we, all we have to do is recompile the SAS, upload the, um, the changed theme to the dev, dev server, and I'm done. Mm -hmm. so, so at what point is that too much overhead? And, and why do I have to wait five minutes? I presume if you're doing all those tests and it's just a, a really, I mean, are, are there breakpoints? Are there a time where you don't need to do a full test regression test because you changed the border on an image? Sure. When you don't care about the result, I think that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it well, really, no, but it really well, is. Well, you could make that argument. Yeah. But by and large, that's really not a problem. Mm -hmm. I, I, I get what you're saying. But, in the, but what we see in the day to day, when we change a single class selector, it's not going to ripple out to other pages, sure. by and large. Yeah. Well, although, all right, who here has ever written a CSS selector that they feel, yeah, like they, that had unintended consequences? <laughs> and as a byproduct of that, how many of us have written overly specific CSS selectors, right. like the blah, 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 you chain it together? So I would say, I, like, I think a, 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 another answer might be you start small. So like, don't, do, don't implement a testing system if you're in maintenance mode on a site, and what's likely to change is adding a border once every three months, or changing a border once every three months. Uh, start with you know your next project build. Uh, do you know like gather your specs in cucumber-like format and start using VHAT. 
Mm -hmm. um, so don't, I mean, like, retrofitting all of this into something that's in maintenance mode is possibly a bit much. Yeah. Although, uh, like, right. that being right. said, once you have <laughs> this, Last Call has done that. Like, they inherited the site that we're looking at. Yeah. Like, all right, because we know all the pieces, we've got the things, we can just bump, drop it over here, uh, figure out the specifics for this site, do that once, and now everybody's still in our same process. So I think, you know, hopefully that's a little bit more nuanced in real world. So just one more indulgence. Can, can, you, can you tier it? So that you, rather than you, so let's say we're gonna push to our dev server, mm -hmm. and we don't need to have a full rich panoply of tests. Sure. That we can set up different workflows in that sure. manner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you just have a conditional based on the branch that you're actually under test. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, if you, can, if you can write down the logic, you can teach it to a computer. I'm going to keep it like this. I like Lemmy from Motorhead, you know? So. <laughs> um, uh, if you do this, then your little button on your dev environment on Pantheon is like yeah. no longer a thing, right? Yeah. So um, what do you do to watch Pantheon's uh, drops eight um, thing so you know when eight got updated? Yeah. So um, that's a very good question and not one that I have a great answer to. Uh, currently, drops eight is almost in perfect sync with uh, upstream Drupal 8. Uh, it would be nice if, let me just back up for a second. Um, we're pulling it in through Composer. So theoretically, uh, if Drops8 were to release a core-only repository, uh, we could pull that in the same as we're pulling in Drupal core. Uh, and that would be no different. Um, there is this concept of the Drupal Composer, I forget exactly what it's called, but where basically Composer downloads all of Drupal core and then pulls out the slash core directory, uh, which makes things slightly more complicated for us and is the reason that we don't uh, tightly mirror drops eight right now. D does that answer the question? Kind of? Yeah. Okay. For the, and for those of you who happen to be using Pantheon and looking to adopt this in some ways, um, we have people at our booth that are like Super happy to help, like pretty smart people can talk about composer workflows and like, how do I do this with, you know, like get to those edge cases and explore it, so. Yep. So you talked about having your local repository, which was just your custom and config only, and then mm -hmm. pushing it through to create the artifact, which goes to Pantheon, but you also talked about local development and testing. Where yep. does that fit in the cycle? Yeah, so locally we're gonna be running the gulp install command, just like we, we did up on CI. And uh, so that's gonna pull down our composer dependencies and that stuff the same way. And I think that's a kind of a critical part of the process that we're running this the exact same way in CI as we will for local setup. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Hi, I have a simple a quick question. Sure. Like when you were doing uh, you know, test compile in the very beginning of the slide, mm -hmm. I noticed that you, you didn't, you only pushed the, uh, the test file, not the CSS file. So right. Generally, is it a good idea to include the compile CSS in the Git repo, or is it better not to include it? Much better not to include it, in my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and this is kind of what this whole process is for in a lot of ways, is to make sure that you're only committing the bare minimum required to build this site, mm -hmm. uh, because there are a lot of risks of you know merge conflicts yeah, and yeah. that kind of stuff. I always went into that yeah. yeah. And let's say like I made a change Mm -hmm. and my teammate wants to this work on, on top of my change. Yep. And how does it usually work? Like, do you put like a post commit hook on that, or git if, if someone pulls it, like compile the test, test right away, or? Um, for us, you don't have any CSS. Locally, if I were to pull down your changes, I wouldn't have any actual CSS mm -hmm. until I run the build steps. So they have so. to run like manually. Yeah, okay. yep. So that's, that's, again, where Gulp is at. Uh, so locally, it's gulp. Mm -hmm. On the server level, it, it's circle. And again, it's so philosophically, what you're doing is you're capturing the knowledge mm -hmm. to create, like what's required to build the stuff, mm -hmm. rather than the output of it. Because like, it's a really common thing. Like I, I'm using this tool mm -hmm. to compile, and there, it's a, like different version or different, slightly different tool. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, like everything's a merge conflict, and that just kind of sucks. Oh. So 
have the tool do that, record what's re necessary, record your source, okay. your requirements, and then have the machine take it from there. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, Merge Conflicts was a good keyword because we have a very similar approach in our workflow. We use also pull requests, but we already merge these pull requests after uh, QA. And uh, the reason why we do that is because our clients tend to be very lazy proving or denying those mm -hmm. change requests they post. Yeah. Do you have any, well, kind of magical handle, yeah, like you handle pull requests and resulting merge conflicts? Because I tend to believe that your clients are not ma that much faster than our clients. So I would say that our clients, like, uh, I don't think our clients are any different from your clients, but I think that we as an organization are very cognizant of the fact that the longer a pull request remains open, the more risk is involved. That, that's the point so why we merge really early in the process. Yeah, yeah. so uh, we tend to push our clients very hard to, mm. to get any in-progress features merged in or, or okay. buttoned up in a way where they go to a release branch. I don't know if that's an option for you, but uh, <laughs> I don't have a magic bullet. We, we try to push our clients too, yeah. but well, they don't react every time. Yeah. <laughs> I would, and I would say that's a class of problems that is um, outside of the scope of what computers can do. So, um, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So, so tools will never solve, like technology won't solve human problems and communication and responsiveness is a human problem. And while you can have a tool maybe help prompt someone, like poke them, send them, you know, text them every five minutes until they approve, that's probably also not a good idea. Uh, but so, so, so like this speaks to the, like this doesn't make project management go away. Uh, this is a safety net for developers to be able to uh, confidently deploy change and know that what they've done is in process and they don't have to manage it after that and that it's, you know, pass all the checks, let that flow out of your body, move on to the next thing. Okay. I would also maybe point out that you could get some mileage out of frequently reintegrating master into your feature branches. You might try that. Well, speaking of composer, the composer log file is the, uh, the yeah. place That's the one that'll get you. Then. I hope you have a magical <laughs> solution, but obviously. That's the next tool. Yeah. We'll invent that tool for next year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thanks, <laughs> thanks for the talk. It's really good information. Um, I just have a question about Composer and everything. Like, why don't you just take a snapshot of the live site and merge the code into it, like, really quickly to see if it, you know, causes problems, rather than, like, rebuilding from scratch all the time? Uh, I think it's a test of the process, and it's just, consistency so like making sure that locally I'm using composer install on circle we're using composer install it's just a, a, a consistency thing I think yeah I mean to me it's like the best test would be merging the code right into production to see what happens and mm -hmm. we're doing that but I mean not live like, <laughs> to the real production site but taking yeah, yeah, a snapshot yeah. of production you know, <laughs> merging the code and running tests <laughs> Can we just change it on the live site? Yeah, <laughs> right. But, but I mean, yeah, if you're a snapshot production, you know, do your post sync scripts, you know, turn off cron or whatever, uh -huh. and merge your branch in, run your tests. It would take a lot quicker, right, than importing a database, downloading files, doing all Maybe. this different stuff. Maybe. Uh, I guess you would still have to run like Composer install or whatever. Cause Not if the files are already compiled in there, right? I mean. So if you just commit everything? You don't have to commit everything. I mean, you have a production. At some point, it has to get built. But once yeah. you know, it's built and all the files are there, you just need to start. Adding but what to happens it when you have a change. composer change? Like when you add a new module, you would have to run composer. Install. Yeah, or you have to have a make file that keeps track of that, or you have to like keep yeah. the, all the code in the repository. I mean, yeah, there's different ways to do that, I guess. But yeah, and yeah, I mean, for I trust guess as leading a bunch of developers, like I want the closest thing to live with the code merged into it to see what will happen. But so that's what you're that's what you're getting here. This is exactly what's being built on CI is exactly what's gonna end up on production. Sure. We're essentially overwriting the whole repository on the Pantheon side every push. Right. <laughs> and so the the so there like there there's like maybe like an intellectual like mm, it seems a little bit much to install like like in order to bake is like a Carl Sagan quote, in order to bake an apple pie or make an apple pie, first you have to invent the universe. Like it feels <laughs> a little bit like that. Like you're inventing like 
you're like creating environments and then putting a Drupal inside of it and then putting other <laughs> things inside of that. And then eventually, finally, your JavaScript or CSS mm -hmm. change makes it. Um, however, there's like, a, a, the, there's like a sort of confidence thing and it's also the machines are doing it, it's okay. Like it's, it's machine time and that's increasingly um, not a big obstacle. And so there's well, some time involved. To that point where you want to make a really quick change for a client really fast, so you don't want it to break the whole site, but you don't mm -hmm. want to wait 30 minutes, you know. Um, yeah, all right, so 10 minutes is the speed of change. Yeah, like that's like, but can you do it reliably? There becomes like a trust thing too, because sometimes you're gonna need to install a module, and is your process for installing a module slightly different than the process for changing CSS? And, and then are you managing two processes, and is two more than one, is that, you know, not yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things to think about, for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I don't think any of this stuff is, like, we're all still learning, we're all still growing, we're all still, like, having conversations. This is a point in time, and, sure. you know, yeah. It's awesome. I mean, we're halfway there. We're getting there. You know, nice. Right, this is great. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. It's possible to ask two questions quick? Okay. Uh, first one is, why do we deploy uh, to a Git artifact instead of going directly to and just pushing it to live? Uh, so this is how Pantheon works. Right. So you would need to, Pantheon basically okay. requires you oh. to have uh, but Git. But there's no other need for that, right? No, okay. you, could, you could make a tarball and send it somewhere. Okay. Yeah. This workflow actually does give you a nice rollback process yeah, though, because you're able to, yeah, okay. just roll straight back to whatever the last commit was on Pantheon. Okay. Uh, second question is, uh, I'm in a project that kind of breaks a little bit of the rule. We don't have feature branches and we deploy directly to production. So for getting you know, best practices for Drupal, is there something inherently for Drupal that requires us to have feature branches and also add you know, tests and git dev into the whole thing instead of going directly to live? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> 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 It's worth looking into, though. Yep. <laughs> so if this is out of scope for the presentation, just, just let me know. But uh, so suppose I'm a little bit familiar with this um, LCM workflow. And uh, suppose that um, in this process of working through this CI, uh, I have to do security updates. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, I end up with a merge conflict in my composer.log file. Yeah. And because of circumstances, I absolutely just can't run raw composer update. Mm -hmm. What would be a workaround that you can use? Because you don't want to bypass the system and just push right. up the modules in some other way. Right. But now I've got to jam up and I got to fix it. And the yep. nuclear option just isn't an option. Okay, so the reason that you would have a conflict in your composer.log file uh, is that you made a change in two places. And so really the best way to resolve that would be to rerun both of the changes without touching your composer JSON and then commit the result. Uh, if you open a pull request and uh, code gets deployed to CI server, uh, so you need a number of CI servers matching number of pull requests open, right? Uh, and s until the pull request is closed or m merged, the code is still checked yep. out there. Right. Uh, so you're talking about the so multi-dev instances. Uh, okay, right. So yep. you, you sp uh, provision the new uh, CI server for yep. each new pull request. Yep. Uh, okay. Let me, I think you asked something different, but maybe. I'll answer something else and you choose which answer you like. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> uh -huh. there's a new multi-dev instance for every pull request. So, that, so that's n number of multi-devs and that's, that just happens with Pantheon, it's kind of a cool feature. Uh, with Circle, I think you're asking about like how many instances of a Circle are running. So I'm working on this client, I have a pull request coming through, sure. you, five minutes later, it's the same thing. Uh, how many threads of Circle are running? And I think for that, the answer yeah. is last call has the, you know, pro plan or some yeah. mobile plan which gives you yeah. eight processes and, and it, or something like that. Concurrent like, builds is yeah. what they call it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it, it depends on your plan, but really the answer is as many as you pay for. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't like, <laughs> and, the, and the cost of not having enough is like, it just waits a little while. Right, exactly. Cool, well, that seems to be the end of the questions. Uh, yeah. So thank you everyone for, for staying along. We're still around, it's early in the conference. We're happy to talk more about this all week. 
Also, just as a reminder, uh, contribution sprints are happening on Friday, if you're not already aware. Everyone is welcome. Everyone can contribute. Um, so we've got people there to help mentor other folks. And uh, last but not least, it's really helpful for uh, us as presenters, as human beings, as people who try to do good work, uh, for us to get your feedback and for the Drupal conference to hear that as well. Like, uh, so if you, would, uh, if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to rate this session as well as every, uh, everything else you go to, that, that's good for all of us. Helps us all get better. Thank you. Thanks.